and the live stream should start in a second. All right. Very good. Ajahn, the final morning is here. It's already day yeah, my, Everybody let in? Yeah, good. Excellent. Okay. Great. So you sometimes say the final morning, but retreats keep going on and 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 on. And sometimes when I look at the participants, there's lots of what I keep calling these days the usual suspects. In other words, you'll find out where there's another retreat on and joining, which is wonderful, which is fine. But please don't forget the uh, people, the main reason you're here is to support Anukampa Bikuni uh, projects. So you now please give a focus on to that. But also all the talks which you've given so far have just been focused on meditation. And meditation is the main reason we're here. You know, sometimes you can give all sorts of talks on the theories of Buddhism, all the talks on uh, you know, what the Buddha said and what the Dhamma means and what Nibbana means and dependent origination means and all these other things mean. And sometimes they can get so complicated. They fill people's minds up with ideas and theories and they spend the time arguing on those things. Instead of like spending the time just filling your mind with more knowledge and more, under, more reasons and more facts and stuff, it's sometimes I always feel that what was missing many times in Buddhist practice was actually putting those things into reality, not just as thoughts and ideas in the head, but as motivations, as emotions, and just ways you look and deal with the world. I remember that because sometimes that each one of us is faced with problems in our life. When we are faced with problems, how do we deal with it? And if you have experience, you know, some meditation, peace and clarity, it does change the way in which you look at the world. It does make you more what we call resilient. And even that word resilient, uh, it is something which uh, there's a lovely simile for that in Buddhism. And that's you know, to adapt the Buddha's similes. This is the simile of the guitar string. No guitar string when it's pulled tight, but something hits it. It goes bing. And if you loosen the tension on the guitar string, something hits it, boom. It's got a, a softer resonance and it's got a lower pitch to it. And if there's no tension on that guitar string at all, you find that something hits it and it doesn't resound at all. It doesn't make no sound. It's silent. And I often thought that's one of the reasons why that people get sick, why they get upset, angry, or whatever happens to them, is simply because they are too tight. They're stressed, too tense. Many years ago, someone told me that a psychiatrist saw this man come into his office and said, what's wrong with you? And he said, well, I have these delusions. Sometimes I, I think and I act like I'm a marquee. You know, there's, when you have uh, events, like in the garden in summertime, you put this big tent, this marquee out there, and you put tables in there and other stuff so you can have an outdoor function. So sometimes I think I'm a marquee. And other times I think I'm a teepee. A teepee is one of those indigenous like wigwams, they sometimes call them. So that's you know, my problem. Sometimes I imagine I'm a, a, I'm a marquee and other times that I'm a teepee. And the psychologist got it straight away. He said, sir, your problem, your problem is you're too tense. Too tense. Okay, anyway, I thought that's a funny story to begin with. <laughs> it's just, and it's a Buddhist story. These people are too tense. And when they're too tense, they usually mess up. They can do things so easily, you know, when they're not tense. But when they are trying to prove something, it's important to them. The whole world depends upon this. And then, of course, you do mess up. And so often, 
I've seen that in, in even my life, not so much these days. You're trying so hard to do something and that tension inside you makes the whole body and the mind too tight. So you, you cannot sort of perform. Even just you know, some of the chanting we monks and nuns do, we do some chanting, you have to really relax to the max. And if you do, then you don't have to worry about forgetting anything. It's one of the reasons, if you don't know this, one of the reasons why Buddhist monastics, why we prefer um, chanting in the Pali language, because in the Pali language, when we do the chanting, uh, no one else understands when we make mistakes. So we can get away with mistakes <laughs> without anyone noticing it. <laughs> but if it was in English, people would understand and we'd get in big trouble. So, but anyway, when you relax, you tend not to make mistakes. But if you're working very hard to try and achieve something, that tension inside of you means you've lost your resilience. Something goes wrong, someone interferes with you, or interrupts your, your quietness, and you get angry and upset. And that shows you're not really meditating properly. You're not practicing these teachings of the Buddha properly. And when you learn just how to relax more, it's like nothing, nothing can upset you. And that's very impressive actually to see just how these teachings work out in your daily life. You make a mistake, you admit it, you learn from it, you grow from it. This is actually how the Buddha taught. He said, uh, monks, nuns, lay people, disciples, if you make any mistake, acknowledge it, forgive it, no punishment, and then you learn from it. That's a wonderful thing about the kindness in the practice. And the kindness in the practice was something which was there in so many parts of Buddhism. And even in the strictest of monasteries, which I ever went to in Thailand, that there was still so much humor there. And the humor which I saw in Thailand encouraged me that this was a kind place. An example of that, there, there was one of the Thai monks, I went to see him, a very good monk, and uh, people suggested that he was fully enlightened, he probably was. I never uh, stayed long enough with him to really check him out. And I was too young at the time anyway. But I remember just uh, once that when he was, uh, I went to visit, he was doing the chanting, the usual blessing chant in the Pali. And he was, this is how it went. I know Venerable Chanda has heard this many times. He was putting his hand up and going, uh, Sabaroga Winnie Muto. That's how he started. And he will continue. Saba Santa Pawajito, Saba Wera Matigando, Nibuto Chatuang Bawa, Sabi Tio, we were chanting, Sabaroga. He carried on like that, going higher and higher. I thought this monk was crazy. But he would do that every morning in front of the lay community. And the lay community loved it. There was nothing against the vinya for monks chanting like that. But what it was doing, it was getting people encouraged. It was giving energy to them. And they were listening with a, a smile on their face. And I thought that this is a bit weird, but I realized that this was a great monk. That was his characteristic. And this is the way they created so much connection with ordinary people. So those ordinary people could listen with fun, with love, with joy in their heart, no matter what had happened to them the day before, or just even that morning. And that blessing made their hearts pure, more peaceful. This this afternoon, this, uh, uh, well, actually this morning, uh, I was uh, giving a little bit of counseling to a, a 14 year old girl who you know, having anxiety disorder and said, can you give us some exercises to overcome anxiety disorder? She's an athlete, 
but she has some anxiety panic attacks at the weirdest of times. And I told her that you need to do push-ups in the morning. If you want to be a successful athlete, do the push-ups in the morning. And there's where the 10 push-ups, which I do. Believe it or not, I do 10 push-ups every morning. I said, get out your two fingers, put them on the side of your mouth. One, two, three, four, 10 push-ups on your mouth in front of the mirror in your bathroom in the morning. In other words, start the day laughing at yourself. And if you ever get an anxiety disorder, you will always know if you can find a mirror or just in the mirror of a car or something and push up your, your lips like that, you will find that a panic and laughter cannot exist at the same time. And it's one wonderful little way of realizing that happiness it's not just a waste of time. It's not just entertainment. It's something far deeper than that. It just uplifts the mind. And it sees not just a negativity, but the beauty in the mind. And this is something which uh, I've often taught is an important part of the beginning of meditation. Please never think that, oh no, more meditation only another day to get through. This is not like going to the dentist, and my apologies to any dentist looking at this. This is something which after a while, when you do it properly, you understand it, you look forward to it. The mind leaps towards the meditation. Yeah, meditation time. And that means that you don't have to force or push the mind. It just leaps towards it, enjoys it. Just like um, Louisa with her uh, dogs, uh, you know, the support dogs. Now those dogs love you and you love those dogs. You leap together. It's not as if, it's, oh no, I've got to be with my dog again today. Oh no, I've got to look after the dog. Oh no, the dog's going to look after me. There's a sense of that friendship and that care and that trust and that safety. And that's after a while, you learn that with your, with your whatever you're doing. You learn so to trust yourself, have fun, even with the meditation. And that is where that years ago, this guy, he sort of told me when he was taking me to this meditation retreat, he hadn't done a meditation retreat with me before. He'd done some of the more strict meditation retreats. I say strict, I think it's overly strict. It's not the middle way. But anyway, he went to one of these very strict meditation retreats and the hall was just, you always had to sit there so many uh, minutes a day, and then you get up and had to do some walking meditation and back and sit again. And he had to do this all the time. And, you know, sometimes that if you don't get up early enough in the morning, they come knocking in your door and just drag you, you know, to the hall, you know, to meditate. It's just, and he said it was just like a, it was like the torture chamber. I said, it's not a torture chamber, it's a concentration camp. You know, because know what a concentration camp means. And I said, that attitude to actually to, you know, be uh, trained into thinking that the meditation hall is a torture chamber, there's something terribly wrong with that. The mind won't leap towards the meditation. It will endure it. It will try and get through it, thinking you might get something. You do get perseverance and, and you do get sort of uh, the ability to endure pain, but you don't get enlightened. So I said, stop calling it the, uh, the torture chamber or the concentration camp. And that's where I started calling the hall where we meditate. It was the first time I used the word club med. Club med, club meditation. Not club Mediterranean, club meditation. So club med uh, in England is now Zoom, Anukampa. <laughs> Bikuni meditation retreat. And if you're regarded as club med, your attitude is there's something to enjoy in here, some happiness, some peace, some fantastic stuff. So then you don't get anxious about whatever you do. You kind of have anxiety and joy at the same time. And quite frankly, that sometimes when, however, I have to give big talks or talks on live TV, you no, know, live TV is one of the most scary of things you can ever do. 
because live TV, especially if it's nationwide or something, that, you know, any mistake you make, then that's actually rebroadcast. Anything wise you say these days on state TV, you know, it doesn't really go very far, but you make a big mistake and that's repeated so often. That's why I sometimes feel very uh, uh, compassionate towards politicians. They say a lot of good things, believe it or not. They say one bad thing and that's repeated so many times. But anyway, just learning how to, to enjoy whatever you're doing helps you relax. And when you relax, your body is comfortable. When your body is comfortable, it's easy just to watch the mind with ease. And that's one of the reasons why when people do get tense or they get bored in meditation, that's why I've taught them many different ways of meditating. And one of them was I called backwards breath meditation. And I don't know if any of you know what backwards breath meditation is but I will now demonstrate it to you. Backwards breath meditation was when I asked the meditators, close your eyes, breathe in and out three times, and at the end of the third breath, open your eyes. Simple. And so they breathe in and out three times, at the end of the third breath, they'd open their eyes. And I said, almost certainly, you had started with an in-breath. In breath, out breath, in breath, out breath, in breath, out breath. Now, I said, close your eyes and now breathe in and out three times, but this time start with the out breath, the out breath first and then the in breath, the out breath and then the in breath, the out breath and then the in breath. Do it backwards. When people do that, the backwards breath meditation, they find it is different. It appears differently and it's more interesting. And when, because it's more interesting, it's easier to be aware and you get just more involved in it. You leap towards it with greater sense of, of joy, involvement, it's the same breath, but you're watching it in a different way. And that taught me much about the nature of the human mind, always to anticipate and to always to, to take things for granted and not to look deeply enough into what's happening. When you do the same old thing again and again in the same old way, your mindfulness gets weak. But often, often if you manage to... Um, uh, to do things slightly differently, then you find the mindfulness does sort of increase. So even sometimes people do this, if you're really tired, they do even backwards walking meditation. And that's, they literally do walk backwards. It's not sort of some a slightly different uh, part of your mindfulness. You know, they uh, stand up and they walk backwards. And of course, you have to be very mindful of where you are, otherwise you hit the wall behind you or fall over something or other, I don't know. But what you do that, because that creates a greater sense of awareness for you. And there was this old story many years ago. Please, I don't recommend you do this, but this was some of the old stories from the forest monastery traditions that sometimes that there was this uh, monastery in Laos, jungle forest monastery in Laos. And I only know one monk who went there. He said, this is how they trained you. The meditation master, the old monk, would take you on a walk through the jungle in the mountains. You now, most of the day, you have finished your lunch. And then in the afternoon, just this long walk. And towards you know, the evening time, still light, he would always come to this place in the jungle. It's kind of a clearing. They had these huge trees in that forest right there. And on the high up on the trees in one of the big branches of these meditation platforms, just no square uh, pieces of uneven wood, no railings on them, but a bamboo ladder to climb up. And every young monk had to climb up this bamboo ladder 
sit on this, this platform with no railings, just big enough to sit on, but you know, no sort of area, you know, uh, on the side or the front or the back. And then the meditation master would take the ladder away and say, I'm going to come back tomorrow morning. And these monks had to sit up there all night, no room to lay down, no way of climbing down, stuck up on these platforms with nowhere to go except death, or if they did survive, it would be just tiger food when the tigers came roaming in the evening. It's pretty scary. But he said that many of the monks who did that got amazing meditation afterwards because they had to. At least he said, the monks who survived. You can't do that these days because occupational health and safety will sort of send me to prison even for suggesting things like that. But there was an interesting way that sometimes when you really have to, you can. It's that part of the mind, you're not forcing it, you're just making it more interesting and more meaningful when we're doing things like coming into the present moment. It's also one of the reasons why people with sicknesses, they tend to get good meditations pretty quickly. Why? It's because they have to. Otherwise, you'll find you're going to be in big trouble. Even when I was uh, only five years as a monk, I remember just uh, going from one monastery to another. It wasn't that far, but to actually get there, there was a lot of walking. And then in one of these buses in Thailand, where you know you were squashed for hours you know, with the chickens and the ducks and everything else they were taking, you know, it's a village bus. And by the time I got to the monastery where I was intending to get to, it was about 5:30 in the afternoon. You've been traveling most of the day, you're sweaty, tired. And then when I got to this monastery, they said, Oh, you're just in time, you've got about a quarter of an hour, and then we're having our evening meeting. And their evening meeting was just a four hour meditation sit. Ah, I've been traveling all day, I'm tired. Ah. I said, well, that's, that's our monastery rules. So I remember just doing that, the four hour meditation. I, what I had time to do, I don't think I even had time to have a wash, just unpack the, uh, my bowl and put my robe on the line, quickly wash my face, go to the toilet, and then go and sit down to meditate. It was really a tough ask. But if you know how to meditate, you don't mess around. You just go deep inside the mind and you meditate there. I remember just complaining afterwards, those monks' behavior, because they only, they rang the bell after three hours and 45 minutes, apparently. That's too early. You're taking 50 minutes away from me. I was, I was having fun, honestly. And so this is actually sometimes how. And it's really important. It's amazing what you can do. Because of that, the meditation also gives you a sense of courage. A sense of being able to, okay, let's try this out, let's see if it works. And a lot of time, without being stupid about what you're trying to do, a lot of times you find it does work. Weird stuff. And one of the other types of meditation, I haven't taught this much to you this time, but it's really worth teaching because sometimes you do get sick. You have not sort of chronic sicknesses as much as acute sicknesses. In other words, these are sicknesses which you know, suddenly appear in you and how you deal with them. And the one I'm going to talk about now is a, a way well known, I'd say about it very often, but it's totally, absolutely accurate, true. Just having food poisoning. And this was over here in Australia. I don't know what I ate. Because, you know, sometimes people bring in food, they, they really try their best to give you delicious food. And you can't blame the lay people, but sometimes oh, something goes wrong. Sometimes I leave the food a little bit too long and some bugs get into it or I don't know. But on this occasion, it's full on food poisoning. You know, it's in my, sometimes you think oh, it's just a bit of indigestion, it'll pass away. But this time it was full on food poisoning in my cave i live in a cave uh, there was a monk built cave the reason they built the cave and why i was very happy they did was because it gives me seclusion 
And main seclusion means when any of the monks just uh, need me in the afternoon, a certain time of the day, they can't get me because there's two doors and you, you knock on the outside door and they can't hear it inside. So it's really lovely. I really love that place. But anyway, I was inside my cave. If I get really ill in there, really sick, then you just have to die because there's no emergency bells or anything. So it's a wonderful little place where you can have some seclusion from the world. What happens if you do get sick? This was one of those occasions, getting sick with, with uh, food poisoning. And when I get food poisoning, that what happened? I think Ayah Chanda knows what's coming in a moment. When you get food poisoning, you get these contractions in your stomach, which is just excruciating. So every few seconds, I was going, ah! Ah! Oh! And you know, I love doing that during some talks when people are just, it may be a hot day and they're falling asleep. And go, ah! And it wakes people up. It gets their attention when you're giving talks. But anyway, that was true. I was describing what it was like. And the thought came, should I just go down? The only phone we had was in an office, which was maybe, oh, it was only maybe 200 meters away. But when you're really sick, I mean, it's, a, it's a long way. And anyway, because we live in a forest monastery, the doctors are a long way away. And even just if you ring up the ambulance, the ambulance says, uh, can you please explain exactly where you are? It takes ever half an hour to get here, minimum, because you know we're secluded. So because of that, I thought, nah, no need to ring the ambulance. This is how I teach other people. Why don't I practice it myself? So what you did, you know, you've learned for many, many years is how to be mindful of unpleasant things. Knowing that it's only sort of a, a chronic pain and then it vanishes and it comes back again and it vanishes. But then I decided to be kind to it. So open the door of my heart to that pain. To let it be, I couldn't control it, it's gonna happen anyway. The weird thing was, you might say it's weird, even I know what's gonna happen, I always think this is incredible. I mean, incredible, powerful, but just unbelievable how easy this is to do. And then you just, the pain started getting less every time. Your mindfulness noticed that something was easing off. You were relaxing. What I was doing, not just being mindful, but being kind. It was kindfulness again. That kindness was so powerful. Every time you had a contraction, sort of a, a, a spasm in your stomach, the kindness kicked in and it wasn't so painful. Only a tiny bit less, but every time it was a tiny bit less, a tiny bit less, a tiny bit less. And after about half an hour, sometimes I say 40 minutes or 20 minutes, I can't remember exactly how much but only about that sort of time. After half an hour, the contractions had totally vanished. There was no pain there left at all. No stomach ache, nothing. It was just a healthy stomach. And it was just ooh, amazing to experience that personally. You were in big trouble painfully and really thinking about calling an ambulance because I have no medicine in my cave. And instead just sit down there quietly and just focus on the pain. Go right into it, right inside it. Sometimes when you do things like that, you find that the pain vanishes and goes. And afterwards, I often thought, what had happened to all those bacteria or viruses, whatever it was causing the pain, causing the inflammation? And the times when I did see bacteria through microscopes, I always remember them as little blobs with tentacles coming out of them. And I just kind of imagined my visualization, saw those little uh, bacteria globules and with all of their tentacles all crossed like in meditation or the left hand over the right hand. And I imagined that all these bacteria were meditating in my tummy. And so they weren't, rampaging around and causing pain. 
because you can't just suddenly get bacteria to disappear. But just say, calm down, they weren't causing any problem whatsoever to me. And I was honest, and then uh, food poison never came back again. The fact that you could experience that, and then you teach it to others, so other people can also overcome any fears of pain, incredible pain, and be relieved of it. That's the only reason why I, I tell these stories, because once you learn how to meditate, be kind, be aware, then you find the body does relax and irritations can vanish. Arthritis, this is elderly lady in Poland, wrote this beautiful letter to me, email, sorry, how her arthritis, extreme arthritis, having to take medication which had hugely disruptive side effects in her life the painkillers and instead she learned how to meditate and it worked for her she said i don't need those painkillers anymore because the arthritis is gone and to me that okay that's a, the best honestly the best donations i ever receive are words like that saying this actually works and there's a one woman in the world and there's obviously many who actually that they have survived they don't have the pain anymore. But it's not just not having the pain anymore and not being able to live a life. They've learned so much Dhamma from that. You may read that in the books. You may figure it out for yourself logically. But experiencing it is a totally different, different uh, ball game. It works and it's wonderful and it's peaceful and it's joyful. And you feel so much more free in this world. But number one, it's something which you, you uh, arrange for yourself and you're not at the mercy of other uh, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists. This works for you. And uh, also, I don't know why I'm talking about this, but this has actually just came up just to maybe help inspire you and give you other ways of dealing with the difficult problems of life. One of the most extreme uh, examples of this was, I'm sure this is organizations in other parts of the world, but over here in Perth, I was invited to visit uh, an organization called Assets. And it was uh, an acronym for the Australian Society of Survivors of Torture and Trauma. And these are uh, really unfortunate people you know, who've been some countries where you're <coughs> abducted in the middle of the night and put into places where you don't know, dark underground dungeons or whatever, tortured, raped and beaten. And some of these people survive. And they make it sort of overseas as, as refugees. And when they come, they have freedom of movement a country like Australia or UK or Europe, there's so much freedom there. But they can't really sort of have freedom of their mind. They're still uh, in those torture chambers and underground sort of military camps where they're just hurt for no real reason, intensely. And this particular group of psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, their job is to give healing to some of these uh, people who seek asylum in Australia. And I remember just you know, hearing just some of the details of what these women and men go through, have gone through. And, and it is it's mind boggling to me just how one human being could treat another human being. It was also amazing just how they could find freedom from their past. And apparently the reason I was invited there was because many of the people who work there came to our meditation center and our temple in town. I remember one of them saying to me, I'm not exaggerating, they said that we get our 
ability of getting our license to teach by going through the universities. But everything practical which they 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 uh, they learn, they come and learn from Buddhist centers like mine. And this is what they learned there. They learned like opening the door of your heart. And this is how they practiced it. And I was just really touched. The reason why I keep telling this story so many times and probably too much inspires me. I enjoy saying this because it's powerful. And they said that when their client from overseas somewhere has gone through hell, real hell, when they actually they are ready, they feel confident, they feel, most of all, feel safe. And nothing is going to happen to them. And if they go too far, they can always come back again. They feel confident of giving this little uh, meditation a go. They sit in a comfortable posture. And they imagine a heart in their, in their stomach, in their chest, a Valentine's Day heart, not a, uh, a real heart, because that's just too, it's not inspiring, it's too complicated. You know, it's just little arteries and veins going, up, going all over the place. The human heart, to me anyway, when I see a real one in a jar in a medical lab or something, it's not all that inspiring, but the Valentine's Day heart, you know, it's, it's, I don't know, that, that feels like a symbol of love and kindness and acceptance and warmth. So imagine like a Valentine's heart in your chest. And then you imagine two doors in it, right in the center. Like the doors of a, of a hotel, the doors of a hospital, or doors of a big house. And then when you imagine those two doors, you open those two doors, and inside your heart is you, or rather the part of you which you trust, which you're at peace with, which you can accept, the part of you which is positive, which was experience kindness in the past or love or peace. As many times you haven't always been abused. As many times in your life you've had lots of fun, lots of joy, lots of peace, lots of respect. You felt kindness. But then you look outside that door, on the ground, in the cold, rejected, stigmatized, expelled. You see all those Little you, yous, a little girl or young woman, the boys who were abused and treated so badly, you know, raped and beaten, so bad for no reason. And they're outside in the cold, outside of your heart, expelled, stigmatized. You can't sometimes even bear to think about them. But what you do? You imagine a ladder going down, like the ladders on those aircraft long ago, which come out from the door. And you see those little youths of your past, a little girl who, who bears your name. Do you remember that was me? I enjoyed that. You say to them, little me from the past, this little abused girl, this boy who's so badly treated, the door of my heart is open to you. No matter who you are, where you come from, what you've experienced, the door of my heart is open. Come in. And no longer are you having, it's a tough thing for me to say, no longer are you having aversion to what you went through. You're actually in, inviting it up. It takes a lot of courage a lot of, a lot of uh, time to get these parts of you to walk up these steps. And you can visualize it. These parts of you, are, they, feel from, they feel ashamed. They feel afraid. They feel terrified. You say, come up. And they do come up. One by one, as many of these people which is part of who you are, come back into your heart. You wrap your arms around you. You say, I will never, I will never be ashamed of you again. I will never be angry again. 
come in. You're part of who I am. One by one, after many times, they come in. And it actually, the results are pretty astounding. I remember meeting one of these women just after one of the talks I gave at our Nolamara Center. They weren't sitting right in front of me, they are sitting to the side. One of the young men who often comes to our center was talking to them and she was explaining what had happened to her. No fault of hers. And just the torture she'd been through. And then this boy said, that's terrible what happened to you. And I remember that because I was looking at the, you know, the I was supposed to be talking to somebody else, but I just couldn't help but just look at the two of them. And the woman turned around to him and said, you've got no right to say that. That's a terrible thing which happened to you. That's who I am. I'm at peace with that. I've embraced it. I've allowed it into my heart. It's not a problem anymore. I'm free. When I heard that, I went to visit their place and see what they were doing. I thought, wow, this type of meditation techniques, they're incredibly powerful. The important thing again was she did that by herself. All the people in there in different stages, when they're ready, you got psychologists around in case there's any uh, excessive reaction to the trauma, any little psychosis happens or whatever, they're there to calm everybody down. They're in control of the process. They do it themselves. And the results was, for me, mind-boggling. It's all right to say, may all beings be happy and well. But actually to make that happen, not all beings, but some beings. Some of the, for me, I thought the most uh, impossible cases to see it actually happen. And that was so inspiring to see. So these things actually work. Needs just the mindfulness and the kindness working together. And be innovative. Don't try to get rid of problems. That just adds to say the door of my heart is open to these problems. Come in. But also please remember a door has two functions, to allow things in and to allow things to leave. <laughs> so keep the door open so all the pain and negativity can one day leave. Okay, so I, as usual, talk too much, but that's my nature. <laughs> that's what I get, get asked to do. Maybe not too much, but anyway. And the reason is, if you don't know, I had my 70th birthday this year. And it's something I noticed, even when I was young. But as you get older and older and older, you know, your eyes start to lose their, their focus, so you have to wear glasses. Your ears are not so good as they used to be, so you can't hear properly. You may have an old grandfather or grandmother or like that. They can't hear properly. They can't talk properly. Your hands are sort of are not so um, stable. Your legs are difficult to walk everything starts to get weaker and weaker and weaker as you get older. But the one thing which gets stronger with age is your mouth. Old people can really talk a long time. <laughs> that's why I can keep on going for a long time talking. So anyway, that's because I'm getting old. I'm talking too much. The last thing I do know, though, I said this at my birthday, the more birthdays you have, the more birthdays you have, the older you live. That's a positive side of having birthdays. Anyway, enough about that. So there's a toilet break. Okay, so after, if you want to go to the toilet, please do so. And then to let things go. And then afterwards we do a little meditation. Thank you, okay. <clears throat> oh, your speaking is very valuable, I think. So it's not too much. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Essentially, you've been on time most of this retreat. 
Yeah, sort of. <laughs> Starting on time, but sometimes finishing a little bit longer. Yeah. Not right. Yeah. And also giving more at the end. Yeah, but that's, you don't have to thank me for giving. I thank you for the, giving me the opportunity to give. And I'm serious about that. So, One of the very nice things, Ajahn, when I call you or want to speak to you, you always say, how can I be of service? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, Which is really lovely, yeah, because then instead of feeling like a burden, you actually feel like someone wants yeah. to. Yeah, I'm not going to say, oh, you again. Oh, you, <laughs> <laughs> you might think it, but <laughs> you're oh, not going to no. say it. <laughs> uh, as you say, so you think. As you think, so you say. <laughs> That's kind of the honesty which is being put into you as being a, a Buddhist monk and Buddhist nun. You know, they just why not tell people how you feel? And after a while, you just you're not you're not tense by trying to to uh, say things which you you're not. I love telling people all the mistakes I make. Yeah, <laughs> many though. Oh yeah, well the funny ones. What's one of the funny ones I've done? Oh, um, uh, yeah. That, that chanting that you did. Oh, oh yeah, that's just, oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, because I, I say this, it's as a positive res response in there that people actually uh, tell me, please, when they do a wedding so, uh, chanting for them, please do the right chanting for us. Because in this particular case, I was tired, working a bit too much. And then uh, at a wedding, chanting i i did the funeral chanting for the couple instead of the wedding chant and they didn't they didn't know at all what i was chanting it was in party but it was a funeral chant and i never told them <laughs> maybe i should have told them but they're, they're still happy married it worked <laughs> so be careful don't don't ask me to do wedding chanting for you if you do please make sure that I'm not too tired and I don't do the wrong chant. Well, the chanting I did, oh, you got me going now. The chanting I did for this Chinese man who was in ICU, he was in a coma. And the family, they'd flown over, you know, from uh, Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong, I don't know from where, <laughs> you know, to be with their patriarch for the last time. And then I did my chanting and I really gave it to him, really powerful chanting. And he actually, Recovered right there. You know, he's opened his eyes. He came out of his his, uh, his coma. And that's when I got into big trouble. And the family said, look, it's probably going to survive now. And the doctors, you know, said that. And they said, what have you done? Because they had already arranged the funeral. They just wanted me to go there into the ICU just to give some wonderful chanting so you can have a pleasant rebirth. And I messed up all their plans. And they said, listen, we're going to have to go back to our home countries and then fly back again later on when he really gets sick. And you just wasted a lot of money for us. <laughs> and that's true. I'm honest there. That's what happened. And so I never got, usually in that uh, tradition, they give, you know, I had a driver there, give like a little donation. You know, they call them Ang Pao, red packets. They gave no Ang Pao that, that day. They didn't get any donation at all. They never invited me back again, <laughs> simply because I did the wrong chanting. I did the get better chant instead of the die peaceful chant. <laughs> and now when people want some chanting, they tell me, like, can you do some chanting? You know, my, my father's sick in hospital or something. said, what chanting do you want? Get better or the die peaceful chanting. You better tell me first of all, otherwise you're gonna get in trouble. <laughs> Different chanting. <laughs> and so when you make mistakes like that, you tell everybody about it. And it's in a sense of a bit of fun there. You know, you're making a bit of mistakes, having some joy, and just <laughs> realizing some of the almost like the stupidity of life. But anyway, so if I give you any chanting later on. Uh, Aya Chanda, please let me know what chanting you want. Die peaceful <laughs> chant or get better chant. 
I remember I did ask that question to you when I think it was Boris Johnson got COVID. And then I said, I'll do some charting for him. <laughs> I said, what charting do you want me to give for him? And I won't tell people what you answered. <laughs> bank on that. <laughs> <laughs> Let me laugh. Yeah. Yeah. But there's something very deep to that, isn't there? Because um, one of people's yeah. deepest mis uh, fears is making mistakes. And I think when leaders, and especially spiritual teachers, can show that yeah. they make mistakes, it, it, um, yeah. it's quite a relief for other people. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't have to be perfect. I can be bent and twisted and leaning all over the place with the trees in the forest and they become the most respected and beautiful ones. Okie dokie. Midi, okay. So time to meditate? Okay, here we go. It's just not a, not an ordinary meditation. This will be an extraordinary one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> See what happens. So here we go. So when you're ready, please close your eyes. Go okay, with your eyes closed. Please bring your awareness to your body, poor old body. And if there is any part of my body which is really asking for attention, I will give it to that part of the body even first. So my tummy was a little bit sort of burpy. So I give attention to my stomach first today. My little stomach. You've been doing so much good work for me over these years. So often that people bring all sorts of stuff for me to eat. And I put it in to my mouth and you digest it for me. Sometimes I don't know what they put in there. It's as if I don't own my stomach. You've been so good looking after me all these years. And just that respect and the gratitude which I have to one little part of my body. You know, I just feel the, that part of the body just so relaxed now. It's giving you gratitude. And people are grateful to you for all the things which you do for others. They say thank you and they really mean it. They really mean thank you. Thank you for being you. What does that do to you? Everything just relaxes, it gets warm. So I, I thank my toes right now. Sometimes you are so far away from my head and so far away from my heart, usually, my little toes, big toes and middle toes. Thank you for looking after me, keeping me balanced when I walk, now allowing me to uh, sometimes put a bit of pressure on you when I cross my legs to meditate. I appreciate you. The same with the soles of my feet and the, the uppers as well, the whole feet. I'm grateful. And even the heel of my feet, you take a lot of pressure. But you know, you look after me. I try and look after you as best as possible. And I'm grateful to you. You know that I never thought you could be mindful, so mindful of just a small part of the body as the heel of your feet. I can feel them now. I'm aware of, I really can't describe the feeling, the sensation, but it's there. 
I don't try and name it or change it, I let it be. I open the door of my heart to the feelings in the heels of my feet. They respond with, <laughs> I'm just describing things, not making it up, that tingling. It tingles with pleasure. It's like, wow, you really noticed me? Thank you. And I go up from the heels to my ankles. And if you ever twisted your ankles or broken ankles or something, but this is a narrow part of your body, but it supports all this incredible weight of your body. So I say, thank you. I can feel it. I relax it. And this, I don't know if anything's actually moving, but it feels like it's opening up, being more peaceful, more comfortable. And it's pleasant to observe. And I move up to my legs, calves, big muscles on the back of my lower legs, and the front of the legs, and the bones. I feel them. Some people say just imagining it doesn't matter. Imagining or really feeling it, it still has the same effect of relaxing everything down there. So it feels at ease. If any healing which is necessary can occur. Then to your knees. So many people want knee reconstructions or something because they've fallen over or they've injured themselves, banged their knees or whatever. Especially when you sit cross-legged in meditation for so many years. You think you've done any damage to those knees? But honestly, my knees, knees feel fantastic. That's why I can sit in meditation for long periods. Why even just doing ceremonies and chanting or talking, sit cross-legged, that's usually fine. And from my knees, thank you, knees, for looking after me. And to my thighs. You know that you know, I am um, uh, quite, uh, well, I say to the fellow monks, I've got gravitas. And they say, yes, yeah, that means fat. <laughs> so my thighs have to support so much weight. And they do it so well. I thank you, thighs. The thigh bones. And the skin in that area. And when I say thank you, how gratitude, the, the thighs they do relax more. I go to my butt. Oh, I spend so much time sitting down these days. Because I sit down so much, those muscles in my butt have to, again, endure a lot of pressure. I care for you. I'm grateful for you. Now I'm just, I need to stretch my back a bit. So I'm just going to wiggle you a little bit with your permission, but muscles. Then the feet say thank you. The ankles and the calves and the knees, the thighs, and now the butt too. The whole lower part of my body is at ease. I mean, really at ease. Relaxed to the max. I go up my back. I've already just stretched my back a little bit. I did have sciatica some years ago because of laying concrete. It's totally gone now. Can't feel it at all. So I feel this comfort in my back. And the shoulders, again, nicely relaxed. At ease. You see, everything feels loose. There's no tightness or tension or pressure anywhere. It's 
So my whole back and shoulders is laying on the softest of cotton blankets, or cotton mattresses, sorry. Just cushions all over the place, and so there's no tightness, tension on anything anywhere. And I maintain that perception. I don't need to hold anything tightly. I don't need to stretch things. A lot of times the tension which causes the pain, which causes the illness, is all caused by fear. Before I felt I had to be tense, otherwise something will go wrong. Now I'm at ease to be loose and let things be. In my body, I go down my arms, past my elbows, and my wrists, my hands, make sure every finger feels comfortable. Ignoring little parts of the body can sometimes cause pain afterwards. It's just like you may think that you're an uh, insignificant member of the company in which you work. So you feel that you're not, you're ignored. Someone gives you a little bit of kindness, recognition. And you feel, wow, they know I exist. And they're grateful to me. It causes happiness. And in the body, the joyful feeling of relaxed happiness. And I go back up to my shoulders, ah, my neck. Just moving my neck back and forth. It really needs a little bit of exercise on that neck. It's one of the trouble with looking at a computer, go look at the screen, the little button where the camera is. But when I got my eyes closed, I don't need to look anywhere. So the muscles in my neck can find a position where they feel comfortable. I'm not going to tell them what they're supposed to feel. Just how do you want to be, Nick? How do you want to be positioned? It's your call. I'm not going to tell you. And that training myself to be sensitive to this body in which I live and meditate and eat and walk and sleep and shower. This little body of mine, I care for it. And I'm grateful to my body, how it supported me for 70 years. Amazing. I have had sicknesses, severe sicknesses, but the body and my mind have found a way through them. Thank you. It's my body tingles with being recognized and being felt that I'm not just a, a tool or a possession of yours, which is to be used as much as I possibly can. It's something I care for. And I go up to my face. And all those muscles around my eyes and my mouth, they're actually already pretty relaxed. But I just notice them. Even my eyes, they've done such a lot of work. And my nose, and my mouth, all the talks which my mouth has given over the years. Thank you, mouth. I don't know about you, but when I practice gratitude like this as sincerely as I can, it's the whole face just really relaxes. It's like you know, going to a, what I imagine going to a spa and getting a makeover or something. You just do that with your own mind and your kindness to it. Caring to the max. With gratitude and sense of saying thank you. Thank you for being of service. And I go to my brain. Just between my ears, two inches behind my eyes. Just imagine it. Thank you. 
all the things I've asked you to do, you've done it and more. You've managed to organize things and figure out how things should be done. Never perfect, but it's amazing what you've done. Remembering the scene of the two bad bricks in the wall. You've got 998 million good bricks. My brain. The mistakes I made, I can forgive those. They had a sense of normal, normalcy, nature. Nature is never perfect, and nature is beautiful. Always remember the, the clouds on the horizon or the dust. That's what creates the most beautiful sunsets. And so because there's nothing I want to get rid of, there's anything I'm respectful for. My body is so at ease. It's like it's had a full body massage inside and out. It's like it's been soaking in a spa bath, which in a jacuzzi, I've seen those, but I never got into one. I don't know how they work. That's what it feels like. Been soaking in a bath. And your body is just so at ease. I always feel the joy of deep relaxation. And it's a positive happiness because it's all built of mindfulness and kindness. And just spending a few moments enjoying the results. Not working them out and thinking, but knowing, experiencing how to relax. You feel any tingling, it's a gorgeous feeling. If you weren't around, I'd just stay like this for a while. But now's the time to go inside. Inside your body, inside the mind. This present moment, just now. The past, thank you, past, all the experiences I've had. You taught me so much. I'll never try and get rid of you. You're almost in my heart. You're, you're who I am. I'm not bothered about you. I'm not burdened by you. So the only past I know is how you created this moment, this present moment of peace and joy. The clarity of nothing I want to change. And as for the future, I know for so many times that now is where my future is being made. This moment, this moment is the garden where my future is growing. I don't need to plan anything right now. I need just to be in this moment quietly. With mindfulness and kindness. And then, because I'm in this moment, and I'm kind to this moment. I don't need to think. But similar, the best simile I can give is like as a young person, you listen to music and you don't think anything because every chord which is played by that great orchestra, you're aware of. You don't want to miss one note. I don't want to miss one note of this present moment awareness because every part of it is delightful. 
I'm not trying to get anywhere or do anything or achieve anything better. This moment is more than good enough. I enjoy being here. Peaceful. Calm. And free from any desire. Experiencing the freedom from desire. Being here. Present moment when there's a silence. You don't have to be aware of your breathing. It just comes up for me. I just know it. I know it in the moment, just one breath at a time. One part of one breath at a time. You have enough mindfulness and kindness. It's like you're in awe of all the different feelings which make up one in breath. And the pause between the breaths. And the out breath begins. I'm so grateful to my breath, feeding me with oxygen, taking away all the byproducts, sorry, all the waste products. Are they waste? I know just so the out breath of the carbon dioxide goes to the plants. All this green in the forests where I live. And they release the oxygen with which I breathe in. It's like connecting me to nature. The oxygen comes from the plants. And the carbon dioxide feeds the plants. May I find it very helpful. Sitting here peaceful. Please excuse me again. Time for me to be quiet.
getting close to the end of the meditation. What is it, what is it like inside? How do you feel? What worked? What didn't? This is like a debriefing at the end of this short meditation. is where we get insights, where we learn. It's also where we enjoy peace of mind. How does it feel outside on the surface of your body? Hopefully it remains relaxed and at ease. The aches and pains which you may have started with are far, far less. The body's at peace. Now please open your eyes to end this meditation. Oh. Okay. Yeah. See you again soon. That we can have a peaceful tea time. Yeah. See ya. <laughs>